At my last reenactment in Old Sturbridge Village, I was injured. You see, the musketry that we were firing was, was so very hot that I did in fact receive from it, uh, from the barrel of a gun being thrust onto my flesh so very harshly, a, uh, a rather severe burn. Oh, oh, no, oh, heavens, heavens, no, not, not, not that one, no, that, that, that's just a bit of makeup, that, that was for a medical display, it's, it's all pretend, that, that was just for fun. Uh, no, I'm talking about actually, uh, just a, a very teeny tiny little insignificant blister I received on the tip of my finger, which, um, incidentally is already gone, except for, like, a little outline of where the thing was, um, because, you know, it happened a couple days ago, so it, it, it's well taken care of, it's not, not actually a big deal at all, but, um, but the reason why I wanted to talk about, you see, this little insignificant teeny tiny little blister is because it implies something much, much be um, bigger, much deeper, if you will. Uh, that being that musket barrels, actually I realize that this isn't much of a realization either, but, but I hope that the discussion of it will prove enlightening, that musket barrels get very, very hot. You see, one of those great benefits of historical reenactment is that you get to experience history from a social perspective, from a ground-up perspective. It allows you to experience it in a very hands-on sort of way and come to realizations that you may not have ever considered when you're just reading about the history in a book or perhaps in a primary account or that sort of thing. See. People had always talked, of course, in the past about musket burns and, and, and um, you know, flashes in the pan, sort of, you know, severe burning and scarring that can happen as a result of something going wrong with musketry or with cannon. If, for example, the piece blows up, well, obviously that's going to cause a very severe burning, something a bit more akin to what you're seeing in that picture there. But um, something that would have been a lot more common is something which rather convinces me, I think, that the, the hands of these men, of these soldiers, not only would it have been ridiculously calloused because of you know, the extraordinary work that they're going through, um, unlike myself, um, they would have been very dark, of course, from spending all sorts of, you know, long hours in the sun, something else that's also very unlike my own hands, uh, but they also would have been covered, I'm sure, in these little burn marks, in these little pock marks, because the thing is that when you are out there in a you know, in a field, in, in a battle, for example, uh, first off, think about it, the, the, the barrel of a musket is steel. It's just a long, round piece of steel. It's basically just like a steel pipe. Uh, and it is sitting out there in the hot sun for hours at a time. It inherently is going to get very, very warm, but that's not enough to actually cause, you know, severe burns, at least not usually. It can actually, depending on how hot that sun is, but it's not probably enough to cause severe burns on a regular basis. But think about the situation in which a soldier is most uh, commonly handling and maneuvering around with that gun, you know, going from like one position to another and everything, um, you know, loading and then and, and firing and going to the shoulder and things like that. Um, you know, the, the situation in which a soldier is most commonly touching the barrel of that gun and as well, um, uh, you know, the, the situation in which not only is he touching the barrel most often, but also in which he is most rapidly, you know, maneuvering that gun around himself, in which he, he is not as much paying attention to the precise positioning of his hands, but is relying on the automatic motions of drill. Uh, I'm talking about a battle situation in which, you know, the last thing on your mind is, oh, I don't want to get burnt by the barrel of this gun because, you know, there are people on the other side of the field shooting at you. But the thing is that not only is that barrel going to get extremely hot from the you know, the hot sun beating down on it, but every time you fire that musket, it's a little explo- in fact, it's quite a significantly scaled explosion going on inside that barrel. Musket barrels during a battle get extremely hot, very, very warm, so much so that, you know, towards the end of a bit of a warmer event at a reenactment, you will note, if you look very closely, most of those reenactors are probably going to be, you know, handling the musket a lot more gingerly, you know, like around the base of the stock and be being very careful not to touch the barrel, not even touching the pins on the musket because those little metal pins, you know, like this long, like this thick, um, that are actually keeping that barrel in the musket, at least for the brown bass that Charlottesville uses, barrel bands and whatnot, uh, even those, those little pins, which are not directly exposed to the heat of the sun because they're inside the stock of the wood, um, the wood of the stock rather, uh, or indeed the heat of the firing of the um, of the musketry because it's not, you know, inside the barrel, it's just connected to it at the very base. Um, even those pins get extraordinarily warm. And the reason why I got this very tiny, teeny tiny little blister, a very you know, sort of like perfect circle in this one particular location is because when we fired and I came back down to the prime and load, my middle finger happened to rest itself on the pin of the musket, and it caused pretty much an instant little burn to me. The barrel itself, if you were to fall and have it hit on your face, 
that will cause severe burning and blistering almost right away. The barrels get extraordinarily hot. And again, you'll see at a reenactment during the battle, men are, you know, more sort of gingerly holding them around, being very careful not to touch the barrels. Um, they're, you know, holding things by the slings even as they cast them about to pour the barrel, you know, pour the, um, the powder down the barrel. They don't want to actually touch around the barrel because normally the drill is that when you cast about, you're gripping the musket around the barrel because, you know, it's, it's after you prime and load, you're gripping it around and you send it around this way. You want to be holding the entire thing. Otherwise, it's very, you can't really hold onto it like that. It's very, very difficult. You're holding onto the entire barrel as you load with powder. But when the barrel itself gets so hot that even it's actually a risk that the powder being poured down could just go off, you know, from the, the heat of the barrel, from potentially any uh, sparks or embers sitting at the base of the thing. Uh, it, you know, it, it, if you touch the barrel, it will burn yourself very, very severely. It's really quite amusing, at least after the fact, to remember how gingerly everyone is trying to not touch the barrel during the battles towards the end of the events when, you know, otherwise uh, you're so thoroughly in the mindset of, of, of doing so. Um, Anyways, yeah, that, that was a very long rant, I think, but I thought a quick little video that would be a bit of fun um, is, yes, talking about one of those little side aspects that you don't really think about in terms of historical events until you're actually in the field doing it. Musket barrels get extraordinarily warm, and they would have caused, back in the day, rather severe burns, I'm sure, on a regular basis, as men would be blaring away repeatedly with these things and then gripping onto the barrel when reloading without realizing, and then ah, all of a sudden your fingers are just scorched to the bone, the musket you know, falls down, and it's just, it's just one more element to add to the pure and utter chaos of a battle back during the long 18th, and in fact, a significant portion, if not the entirety, of the 19th centuries. Thank you all so very much for watching, of course, in particular to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com. Uh, as always, it is by, uh, by, you know, by virtue of uh, that beneficent support uh, that allows me to continue the work that I do. And of course, to you as well, my dear viewers, uh, thank you so very much for watching, and of course, until the next time, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.